So, what was it I asked in the last review again? Now to figure out if Richard White managed one last hurrah with Galactic Core. Oh, that's funny. I'm really not trying to pick on Richard White, I swear. Let's start from the beginning here. This is Galactic Core, Richard White's fourth and, as far as I know, final game. Made in 2001, there was actually a two-year gap between Lost Souls and this game. That should be good, with the last three games crammed within the previous two years. With three times as long to work on Galactic Core, this should be good. Right? In a way, it is. It's much more ambitious, at least. We've gone from a pretty decent puzzler to a rather easy management game, to a one-screen strategy game, and now we have a strategy game with more sprawling maps. We have different units and abilities for each faction in Fog of War. It disappears forever once you uncover it, but it's not like this was the only game to do that. Warcraft, Command & Conquer, some of the greats did the same thing. Yes, I know those are real-time and not turn-based, shush. All I'm saying is it has all the elements of a good game and the initial faults seem nitpicky. It does make the lore description for the sensor array inaccurate, but I'm getting ahead of myself. You get into the game and all seems fine at first. You have your ships, you can join them into fleets, have them move, you can colonize and fortify planets. Mines get you minerals, while cities get you currency and speed up your research. You can build mines, but cities have to come naturally. So the longer you hold a planet, the better, and more hospitable planets can hold more cities. Or if your enemy has built up a particularly nice planet, you can load up troops onto transports and take it over with a ground assault, keeping mines and cities intact. It's relatively simple, but there's enough depth here that it actually feels like there's some strategy involved. It's a bit clunky, sure, like any of Richard White's games, but it is the most interesting so far. Besides maybe Rock Solid, though they're two very different games, so your mileage may vary. The game even comes with a full tutorial, which actually does a pretty good job of describing all the mechanics of the game to you, and the Terran campaign, i.e. your basic sci-fi humans, is sort of meant to ease you into everything. They're your typical stubborn determinators that humans tend to be, though there's a twist that their version of World War III was biological, not nuclear. Of course, you have to read the manual for any real lore, but again, typical of the time. For the most part, each species gets similar ships. They get a colony ship for, well, colonizing, a scout ship with high vision range, a troop transport, a cheaper fighter, a heavier fighter built at tech level 2, and then a high-tech special ship of some kind that can't be built until tech level 3. The humans get about what you expect. Their colony ship is one use, the science vessel is made of glass, the carrier is actually relatively durable, and their ships are balanced. Their special unit is interesting, though. The humans get to build space stations, or as they're known in Star Trek Armada, floating death fortresses. They're the only unit in the game that can build other units outside of planets. So you're basically building your own weaker planet, complete with starport. It's pretty cool, but it's also quite expensive, as it should be, and it won't produce any resources for you. It can, however, lead quite the attack with a fleet behind it, when it eventually gets there. Or you can park them around and use them as support bases. You also get things like fractal cores and temporal incursions, so you too can go full Janeway. You also get things like tachon, bunkers, and reactive armor, which help in ground assaults, along with planetary shield, temporal shielding, and deuterium-3 missiles, which help keep people from landing on your planets in the first place. The humans are good at keeping a foothold, is what I'm say- Wait a minute, deuterium-3? Is it- Isn't that just tritium? Okay, good job, you figured out how boosted fission weapons work in this far-flung future. <sighs> Moving on. The Tardanians are next, and they're not anything special. They should be, their special ship is a hollow projection unit, which disguises itself as an attack frigate. Maybe this would be more useful in multiplayer, but when I played against the computer, by the time I was high enough tech level to build it, I was just pumping out frigates and plasma cannons, the almost literal glass cannon of the Tardanian fleet. Their colony ships are slow, cheap cargo containers, their transports are roomy, and their scouts are actually decently armored. Between the transports and tech like the Dreadnought Missile and Psychological Nerve Agent, weird way to phrase that, but okay, anyway, they're good at digging people out of planets. If all else fails, there's the Cascade Stream to completely wipe structures off a planet, or the aptly named Final Solution, which you use to destroy your own planet, 
If you feel like keeping your enemies from gaining a foothold that badly, each piece of tech actually has a bit of flavor text and even some history behind it sometimes, like with the multi-spatial probe, which is pretty neat. It would have been even more cool if each civilization had its own history with the tech they get, because it does overlap. But aside from weird stuff like Deuterium 3, it's all decent writing. The Parok, much like the Tardanians, had a great civil war and looked to the stars, but they invested entirely in their starships. Their colony ships are heavily armored and reusable, and they get quick heavy fighters and space stations, which make me think I really should have saved my floating death fortresses, quote. They don't build units, they're meant to hit hard and absorb damage. You have to face some of these in the campaign, and they're absolutely disgusting. Glorious when you're using them, frustrating when you're on the other end. They get a lot of resource boost, doomsday weapons, and some time bending. The Parrot campaign is where you might notice things start to get strange. By now, you'll have noticed there's no special victory screens at the end of campaigns, they just kind of end, kicking you back to the title. Thanks, I feel accomplished. The AI definitely does some questionable things, and heaven forbid if you let the pathfinding try and get around obstacles for you. I ran into a strange problem where I actually couldn't lose Mission 3 of the Parrot campaign. Also, every lost screen is these decent 3D models with MS Paint damage effects scrawled over them. The game starts to fall apart in front of you by way of death of a thousand cuts. Not to mention I don't think the AI uses special abilities as far as I know. Not that you can tell, any planetary things they do are resolved instantly, but I've never seen a computer use a fractal core or temporal incursion, even when I know they could. The Oris campaign is where the game really falls apart. Aside from the silly acronym, apparently meaning Organically Reliant Species. That sounds like something the friggin' Terrans would come up with, and they were encountered first by humans. Called it! Anyway, they have weird organic ships. Weak, fast colony ships, carriers that are literally asteroids, that sort of thing. Their special ship doesn't seem like much at first. It has about the same strength as their base fighter. But it can regenerate shields at a ludicrous rate, coming back to full health in a maximum of three turns. They have abilities suited to quick ship movement, planet takeovers, and resource saving. I say the game falls apart here because apparently, before the game was patched, you couldn't get past the first mission. I had problems with the second mission myself because the victory condition is oddly specific. You see, the mission is to wipe out Regulus with a Cascade Stream. Fair enough, but you see, I accidentally made the grave mistake of taking over the planet after I wiped it out, and the game just wouldn't have that. That planet must be empty when it checks for victory, or it won't count the mission as passed. That is the stupidest, most nitpicky thing I've seen from a game in quite a while. I did what it asked me to do, but I added a slight bit extra afterwards, and I guess that was just too much. The Corbonians are the technologically advanced loner species of this setting, with ships that are fast, armored, and pack a punch. Aside from the cheap glass cannon drones, all of their ships are exceptional in every way. Including their price. Their special ship is the Planet Killer, which does exactly what you think it does. If a fleet with a Planet Killer makes contact with another planet, it's gone. You don't even get confirmation, I guess it's just assumed if you have a Planet Killer in your fleet, you wanted to kill the planet. Which is a fair assumption, but you'd still think you'd get a button to do it rather than just assume it. Wait, 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 wait. It's powered by 24 Tiberium reactors. Boy, I guess my earlier comparison to Command & Conquer was a bit on the nose. The Garand are the opposite of the Corvonians. They're a warrior species that are so technologically backwards, no one knows how they managed to get warp technology. So they're basically Klingons. Really, really bad Klingons. They get reusable cities, which have a strangely high amount of firepower and possibly the crappiest transports in the game. Due to their shoddy and hurried design, they can't fit their land tanks inside. Your tanks are relegated to defense only. Not sure how much defense matters, because I'm not sure if the AI actually knows how ground assaults work unless you force them into it with bunkers. Which two factions don't have, the Garand being one of them, making their tanks even more pointless. Their scout is made of paper mache, and their two combat ships are your choice between fast, cheap, and weak, or strong, slow, and expensive. Their special ship, if you can call it that, lets you use full Russian tactics. It's very average, but it's very cheap to make, so you can easily deploy full fleets of them. And you'll learn that having full fleets of ships is key to winning battles in this game, because you can't coordinate attacks between fleets. The longer you play, the more you'll think that maybe things in this game are a bit too simple. And that's this whole game in a nutshell, really. Everything is just too simple. Which sounds weird, as I actually spent a while describing this game. 
That's because there's nuance in here. The different species have different abilities, different strengths and weaknesses, different tactics that work with their ships. Potentially. But everything is so bare bones, from pathfinding to combat to the AI, that you'll have to go out of your way to have fun with the special abilities, as the AI never uses them and you never really end up needing them. I do appreciate the extra effort into the writing, at least. It sure beats what we got in Lost Souls. Sure wish some of that time went into playtesting the campaigns. Maybe they would have figured out a black cursor with no outlines in space was a bad idea. However, if, and this is a very big if, you could get some people together, this game does support multiplayer through email. Yes, you can play by email with this game. You can even make your own single player campaign and your own maps for multiplayer. Maybe Galactic Core has some hidden potential as a multiplayer game. Maybe that's the feature that makes Galactic Core into a gleaming polished turd. I'll never know, I can never drag people into playing a game of this. As a single player experience, I can only barely recommend it, and that's if old obscure strategy games interest you. Otherwise, I'd suggest something like Pax Imperia if you're looking for more depth, though you're a braver one than I if you delve into that. If you want something that does the simple turn-based strategy a bit better and also still supports multiplayer, I'd suggest Spaceward Ho. Why do I suggest these? Because they were options around at the time and shine a bit of light on what Galactic Core tried and failed to compete against. Now that I've slogged through that, hopefully next time we visit Spiderweb Software, we'll have more interesting stories to tell. Richard White, I apologize if you find this. I don't aim to be mean to you. Your games all have potential. But they're just very unpolished and needed a bit of extra time if they were going to truly bloom. This is Tanara Kuranov, signing off. Until next time.